on the phone. It's a pleasure to welcome to the program Kristen Burris. She is an associate professor at Georgia State University, the author of Charter Schools, Race, and Urban Space, Where the Market Meets Grassroots Resistance, which is the culmination of her uh, decade-long research into uh, education, so-called education reform, in the wake of Hurricane Katrina in New Orleans. She is a New Orleans native. Uh, Kristen, uh, thanks so much for joining us. Thanks, Sam. So uh, let's let's start. I, I want to go back because the you know, and I, I mentioned to you before uh, we got on that I had seen a, a, a debate that you had with the CEO of New, uh, New Schools in New Orleans, which I um, I'm not 100 percent clear on what uh, what that was, but I assume it is one of those outfits that uh, promotes and runs charters. Exactly. New Schools for New Orleans is exactly that. It's, it's the major charter school incubator in the city of New Orleans and, and was founded about two years after Katrina. Um, and it's basically the conduit for both uh, millions of dollars in philanthropic money to push charter schools as well as federal monies. All right. And, and I should say, we, we will link to that, uh, that debate, too, because I, f- I found it fascinating. Um, the, uh, the moderator was, is a uh, writer for Time magazine, but also served as a consultant to New Orleans schools. And uh, also um, uh, his boss, uh, Walter Isaacson, I don't know, uh, 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 also uh, heavily involved in the uh, school reform movement. Yeah. And, um, but at the beginning of that, and this is where I want to mm-hmm. start, um, the, uh, the, the school reformers want to talk about the failure of... Yeah the education system in New Orleans, uh, and they want to untether it, it seems to me, from the, the, the decades, uh, literally, not decades, I mean, that I think understates it, but the, um, the huge history of, of uh, I guess, racial tensions and the way that, um, that assets were doled out based upon race within the education system in New Orleans prior to Hurricane Katrina. Uh, talk about, give us a sense of what the education system was like prior to Hurricane Katrina in New Orleans and, and how it got that way. Yeah, I think that's so important because it's interesting when, it's just as you said, when these education entrepreneurs, as I call them, are pushing charter school reform, they have no historical memory whatsoever. Um, which is strange because whenever it, it seems to me, whenever you talk about reform um, or you have a vision of making things better, the, the solution should be attached to the cause of the problem, right? And call me crazy, but there should be a link between cause and solution. And yet they completely detach um, any of the argumentation for their reforms t- from the previous history in New Orleans. And so they completely ignore, as you put, not just decades, but centuries uh, of racism um, and white supremacy uh, that, sh- that shaped black education, not just in Louisiana, right. but throughout the South and the nation. So, so in Louisiana, for spe- specifically, and in New Orleans, um, you know, we, we think about the history of black education and ask, well, why, why were black public schools struggling in New Orleans in 2005? We've got to go back much earlier, right? So consider this. You know, um, in the early 1900s, Orleans Parish School Board wanted to limit black public school grades to the first five grades, first through fifth grade. Um, You know, it may stun your listeners to recollect the fact that the first publicly funded black school in New Orleans did not open until 1917. Okay, it was a high school. And the second publicly funded high school uh, for black students in New Orleans didn't open until the, the, the early 40s. Uh, you know, black and white teachers had gross differentiations between what they were paid uh, so that, you know, a, a white teacher with just uh, with no teaching experience in a high school degree often made far more than an African-American teacher with a master's degree and, and years of experience. Um, so, so, so this is the, the legacy, right, of racism that has shaped ongoing state disinvestment in black public schools in New Orleans. And then it only worsened uh, after Brown v. Board of Education when there were demands for integration and there was an immense amount of white flight out of the city between 1950 and the year 2000. 
And as some of those schools became, you know, abandoned and the landscape in New Orleans, the public education landscape became majority black, there was increasing levels of disinvestment. And so, you know, when you, when you get to Hurricane Katrina in 2005 and you see that schools are struggling, well, to me, that's the answer why. The answer is that they've been systematically uh, underfunded by the state um, and that the infrastructure in the black community writ large has been underfunded by the state. And so if that's your starting point, then you can recognize that what is required is not for the state to further back away from its investment in black public schools, which is what it's doing in the charter school movement, right? Turning everything over to private operators and government sort of evacuating itself. Instead, what's required is additional state intervention, more resources, and a very sort of uh, clear vision uh, to support black public schools. And so um, I'm glad that you made that our starting point because I think any understanding of the struggles of New Orleans public schools prior to Hurricane Katrina needs to be put within an historical context. <laughs> and, and this is important, too, I think, because it illustrates um, the, the to, <clears throat> to institute the reforms that those in this corporate reform uh, movement want to institute, they have to create a narrative of what the problem was, and that involves ignoring uh, the reality of what that problem was, right? Well, because yes, and, and, you and, can't and part of the narrative they created, Sam, was, was a scapegoating of black veteran teachers right. and the teachers' union. So you remember I mentioned the differential pay between black and white teachers. It was in the late 1930s that a black teachers' union was formed in New Orleans. It had a long history, along with its veteran teachers, of struggling for educational equity and more resources and so forth. Well, you know, it it wasn't long after Katrina that the narrative began to form, right? That, that, That the reason that New Orleans public schools were failing is because... Uh, you know, uh, teachers and administrators, this was sort of c- racially coded language because the vast majority of teachers and administrators were African American, were lazy, right? Um, and and didn't, uh, weren't up to the task. Um, and so sort of needed to be let go. We needed new, what they call human capital. And so it was a scapegoating of, uh, and a real slap in the face, to be quite frank, uh, to black teachers who had been struggling uh, for, for more than a century. Um, under horrific teaching conditions, uh, but, but stuck around, right? Uh, the te- black teachers in New Orleans um, were a, a, a substantial component of the city's middle class, and so an attack on them was also atta- an attack on the city's black middle class. Um, and so, so that was part of the narrative. You know, and, and maybe we can talk about that in a few minutes, but you know, not long after Katrina, um, there, an announcement went out that every and I, I underscore the word every teacher and school employee in the city of New Orleans would be summarily fired in early 2006. Uh, and, and the union was effectively busted. I'll, I'll pause there. I don't know if you want to talk about that later. Right. Uh, but that's where that headed. And, and, and yes, and so uh, the, uh, you, you must ignore the, the, the literally the decades long, if not centuries long, deprivation of of uh, New Orleans uh, school system in terms of resources, uh, so that you can actually get to what uh, you know you want to create as as the problem, so that your uh, your solutions happen to just coincide with the problem that you've now um, uh, isolated. So, all right. So, give us a sense of 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 what the challenge was. Uh, I mean, the you, you basically have. Uh, in, in many respects, what we're looking at is sort of the classic shock doctrine uh, scenario, right? Where you have this um, this huge catastrophe, and um, uh, in New Orleans, there's all sorts of money ready to come back into New Orleans, uh, ranging from uh, private money, but also federal rebuilding funds that then are leveraged in some fashion. Uh, let, so talk about the, yeah. like what exactly happened after um, uh, the, the, I guess, the, the immediate emergency was over. Yes, yes. That, that's such an important story, and, it, and it's a story that is not largely known to the general public. 
I mean, even f- folks who are sort of fairly informed around these issues don't realize the immensity um, and anti-democratic nature of what transpired within days, not just weeks, within days of Hurricane Katrina hitting. And, and as, as I share this narrative, I think folks across the country need to keep in mind that, that, that what was done in New Orleans and to New Orleans is being touted as a national model. Uh, so, so heed what I say, because I, uh, coming, to, c- coming to a neighborhood near you, okay? Um, so basically when Katrina hit, um, within days of the hurricane strike, the Conservative Heritage Foundation put out a report, a national report, uh, basically saying that, that the president, at the time was Bush, should create a Gulf Opportunity Zone, a Gulf Coast Opportunity Zone uh, that should be uh, market-driven and open up spaces for entrepreneurs, right, uh, to improve the region. And so you, you sort of see what's embedded in this language and you sort of know where we're going. So, so President Bush then came to New Orleans um, and, and in his speech about um, what to do about the destruction, basically um, reiterated all the points from the Hoover Report. Uh, I'm sorry, yeah, from the Heritage, Heritage Report, pardon me, um, and so forth, and, and, and declared that this was going to be a golf opportunity zone. Within two weeks of the hurricane hitting, Margaret Spellings, who at the time was head of uh, the Federal Department of Education, put out a letter to the, the affected states and state leaders indicating that uh, charter schools would probably be the most appropriate mechanism for quickly rebuilding public education and extended 20 some odd million dollars um, that could potentially be utilized by states such as Louisiana and gave them approximately nine days to file for the money. So you can see the very aggressive uh, vision, market-based vision that was unfolding. And mind you, all of this is transpiring while people are still displaced, which basically translates into the notion that we, we, meaning those with power, are going to be making decisions about the public schools in your neighborhoods in your absence and without your input. Okay, so that was two weeks after. Within two months of Hurricane Katrina, this is November of 2005, Louisiana Governor Kathleen Blanco, okay, calls a special legislative session. This is key to understand. That session became the occasion for passing something called Act 35. So get this, prior to Katrina, uh, Louisiana had something called a school performance score, SPS. It was the failure cut point for whether schools were passing or failing. And at that time, before the hurricane hit, the cut point for failure was 60 on a scale of 200. But under that definition of failure, the vast majority of schools did not qualify in New Orleans to be taken over by the state one recovery school district. Well, you can't charter schools you can't take over, right? So what Act 35 did was to strategically move upward the cut point, right? Because the higher you move the cut point, the more schools that are gonna be failing, right? Because your standards are that much higher. So they moved the cut point through Act 35 to, from 60 to 87.4. Under the new cut point, okay, the majority of schools in New Orleans were now failing, and that gave the state leverage to then take them over under the recovery school district and to charter them. And all of this was very strategic. You know, it, it may also interest you to know that Act 35 also stipulated that the recovery school district could only take over schools in a district that had more than 30 failing schools. Well, that's sort of interesting because the majority of school districts in Louisiana have fewer than 30 schools. Right. Okay, okay. so right. let's... So already you're, you're, you're narrowing it down. It was all about taking over the schools in a black majority urban school district, New Orleans. Kathleen Blanco also put out several executive orders that suspended charter school laws that said that in order to charter a school, you had to first solicit the input of the affected teachers, parents, and community members. That was suspended. So in all of these various ways, they, they quickly uh, came in, like you said, shock doctrine, to take over New Orleans public schools 
and to charter them. All right. So let me just let me just re encapsulate that before sure. we, we go back. And so we basically have a situation where uh, they to to um, to allow them to take over the schools. What they basically did is, and I would say it sounds like when you say eighty seven point four in terms of raising the bar. Uh, for the passing grade a school gets. And if a school is passing, it cannot be taken over and charterized. Uh, it sounds a pretty specific number. <laughs> my guess is, is. My guess is uh, 87.1, you lose a bunch of schools that they wanted to get. Uh, well, that you yes, want. yes. And, and, and Sam, let me add this. You know, it, you don't even have to surmise. It has come out through court testimony in the veteran teacher's wrongful termination lawsuit, it came out through that court testimony that, in fact, uh, the state was crunching numbers behind the scenes to figure out the ideal cut point right. to allow them to maximize how many schools they could take over in Orleans Parish. Yeah, at least you'd think there would be the the sort of the the, the self consciousness to say, let's just call it eighty eight because if we do eighty seven point four, that's going to sound really really specific. Um, and and then of course they did the same thing when they said we're only going to apply this to school districts uh, that have uh, X number of schools, thirty schools. And they might as well have said, we're only going to apply this to uh, school districts that are in urban centers, let's say, or uh, New Orleans. I mean, Precisely. that's basically what this what this comes down to. So, all right. So it, now, it, let me add this too, Sam, because because if you could imagine an opponent uh, come come back coming back and saying, well, yeah, they they raised the bar. I mean, it has nothing to do with targeting Orleans Parish. They just wanted to raise standards. Um, across the state. Well, let's not be fooled. I'll, I'll mention this and we can elaborate later, but it, a key point to understand is that after they ratcheted up the cut point to 87.4, once the schools were then taken over and chartered across the city, they began ratcheting the standard back down. Of course. And, 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 and look, <laughs> the bottom, the idea that following a crisis, the first thing you would do I mean, it, it's it's quite clear. There's no there's no logical reason to raise that standard uh, two months after uh, Katrina, unless you basically say we want to make it legal for us to take over these schools and to do so in in a uniquely undemocratic way. With that yeah, said, too, and, with and that racially, said, yeah, in racially targeted ways as well. Because interestingly, St. Tammany Parish, which is is not far from New Orleans um, and is largely white, you know. One, the, there was not a single veteran teacher in St. Tammany Parish that lost their po teaching position versus in Orleans Parish, where the majority of veteran teachers were black, they were all summarily fired, right? Secondarily, again, through court documentation, it's come out that Cecil Picard, who was top of state of Louisiana in education, right, offered all kinds of assistance to St. Tammany Parish to reopen its schools, and the vast majority of public schools in, in St. Tammany were reopened within two months of the storm. On the other hand, in Orleans Parish, Picard obstructed desires on the Orleans, Orleans Parish School Board to reopen public schools. For, for those of us because who of don't they know... they didn't want them open, they wanted to charter them. So Chris, you've got differential treatment between a black and a white parish that were similarly affected by the storm in the same state. Kristen, for those of us who don't, who are not uh, aware of New Orleans, I mean, wh when you look at those two parishes that you said that, uh, that received this disparate treatment... From a uh, a destruction standpoint, from a an evacuation standpoint, were they? I mean, I'm just I'm a yes. devil's advocate here. Were they? Uh, did they have disparate? Uh, did the storm have a disparate impact on on those two places? Yeah, I'm so glad you asked that. The answer is no. Both uh, districts, Orleans Parish and Saint Tammany, had approximately 80 percent of their school buildings either entirely destroyed or substantially damaged. So the damage in these two areas was virtually the same. And and, and I asked that, too, as, as a follow-up in terms of that in and of itself. I mean, if someone, uh, you were to present this information and a, uh, a school reform uh, advocate would say, well, what else could we have done at that point? <laughs> there had to be a certain amount of lack of democracy because people were evacuated. They hadn't come back yet. Uh, we needed to get this thing going. Uh, we couldn't just wait until we could get the normal apparatus going again to, to rebuild our schools. But in fact, You've just outlined exactly what the potential alternate could have been. It was done in the majority white uh, parish. 
Well, absolutely. Picard even assigned St. Tammany what was called a hurricane buddy, which was basically someone at the state level to assist them t- through navigating red tape. They provided them with an office and a phone and all kinds of other resources to get the schools back up and running. Again, that did not happen in Orleans Parish. You know, the other crazy thing, too, uh, in terms of sort of um, the strategic nature of this, I mean, this is truly heinous, what I'm about to describe. And again, this pertains to the wrongful termination suit by the te- uh, for the teachers in Orleans Parish. So, so when the announcement went out that these veteran teachers were going to be fired across the board, uh, I mean, without any due process uh, whatsoever, um, you know, pr- right after Katrina, uh, they had begun to establish a call-in center so that displaced Orleans Parish teachers could call in, they could give updated contact information, and fill out intent to return forms. Right, that they had intent to return to their, their former schools and their former positions. So, so there was access to all this data. And yet when they sent out the termination letters to these teachers, one, they sent the letters to the destroyed addresses in New Orleans, which people no longer occupied at the time, right? Two, told the teachers who weren't at those addresses, because they didn't use the updated ones, told the teachers they had 10 days to respond if they had a grievance or wanted to contest their firing, okay, which is ridiculous. Again, you know, 10 days. Um, And then finally, if they were to respond within 10 days, told them to send their grievance to the pre-storm address of Orleans Parish School Board, where, of course, the board was no longer located because it had been destroyed. So at every turn, you see a strategic effort to, to dispossess and to disenfranchise these teachers. But uh, but uh, basically also a um, a way of saying, but we did everything by the book. Uh, <laughs> right. It's just that we got, you know, we got a couple of addresses wrong and we got a couple of. Uh, uh, so, I mean, this was so there was clearly an impetus uh, by, it appears, state uh, and I guess uh, federal officials. Uh, yes, and, and local officials as well. Uh, and local officials to do this. I mean, there was definitely, uh, as I recall, a you know, this was definitely in the air, right? That we're going to take this opportunity to remake New Orleans. We're going to, uh, and I think uh, you've called it um, uh, the, it is um, white, white, uh, it is white acquisition through um, dispossession. Can, uh, yes, yes. I, I'm building on a professor, David Harvey, um, who, uh, who's a geographer, and he calls this accumulation by dispossession, right? So one you know, group accumulates assets for its own sort of financial and racial benefit by dispossessing others of those assets. And that's exactly what we see, because to speak in very blunt terms, you're talking about dispossessing a black parents, black students, and black veteran teachers, right, in the city of New Orleans from the public school system, the assets they had, sort of, in a sense, invested in their neighborhoods, and turning over all of those local, state, and federal resources to a group of largely white entrepreneurs who hail from beyond the city who have taken over to run the schools um, and, and are, are <laughs> uh, flourishing financially through this grand experiment and we can talk about that if you wish yes uh, let's so let's talk, talk about, about what has transpired in these in this so-called miracle school district since 2005 right let's talk about that because i mean the the, the there's there's many different sort of i guess um uh a- angles to this notion of this of new orleans being a a miracle school district because one it talks about um one way that it, it you know arguably is done is we've just simply um we've brought in a new student body in some respects or we have dispossessed the existing uh student body uh we have conformed the student body <clears throat> to be um far mm-hmm. more i guess um uh, Likely to excel. Yes, exactly. And, and so, yes. So, tell us about that uh, broadly speaking. Sure. So, so the first thing, you know, we talk about the, the changing the school performance score cut point, right? So that's one thing to keep in mind when, when people talk about sort of New Orleans achievement, right? When you're looking at the, at the the letter grades issued by the state, which, by the way, are horrific. Uh, the vast majority of charter schools in the recovery school district uh, are, are are still. Um, low-performing, failing schools. 
Um, but that said, uh, keep in mind, this is even after they're being judged by a lower standard because the current standard is not 87.4 on a scale of 200, right, which is what they use to take over Orleans Parish schools. It's not even 60 on a scale of 200. It's now 50 on so a they, scale of 150. So, so, so they're, they've so, dropped so it to pre-Katrina levels, right? They've dropped it to pre-Katrina levels. Lower. Yes. Okay. Lower. They've dropped it to uh, and, and so they're not even comparing apples to oranges, right? So they're not. They use one standard to judge uh, the traditional public schools of New Orleans at the time of Katrina, and they've used a much lower standard to judge the charter schools since then. So that's the first sort of thing. And in fact, that's why thing, you say that's why you determine passing or failing, as opposed to just a number grade, right? I mean, right. because if you had to state the number grade, it would be extremely accessible. We would all well, we wouldn't need to be talking to someone who's been studying this stuff for ten years. We could just say, "Hey, the, these schools uh, were all rated X, uh, you know, prior to um, uh, Katrina, and now they're at Y." And that's uh, okay. So go ahead. Yeah. Well, yes, yes. And, and to invoke sort of a New Orleans sort of a metaphor, it's very the the performance data is muddy waters. Okay. Right. Uh, when it comes to the state, because. And, 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 to, and to the education entrepreneurs who like to float around their own data sets, right? And very often it's not clear what their data sources are. It's not clear what, the, what statistical methods were used to arrive at the numbers they're providing. Very often the, the references they'll provide are blogs and other kinds of, of standards of evidence that would not really meet uh, the satisfaction of any reputable statistician. So that's the first thing. The second thing is the students that you mentioned, right? So, you know, traditional New Orleans public schools, albeit imperfectly, served all comers, okay? This is not the case with New Orleans charter schools. Uh, some of them have uh, formal selective admission requirements. Some of them have informal ones, right, that sort of operate um, in sort of more, in more devious ways around screening kids, mm -hmm. you know, and, 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 and evidence of this, okay, one form of evidence uh, to consider is a recent lawsuit that was put forth by the Southern Poverty Law Center. In this lawsuit, uh, 4,500 disabled kids allege that charter school, that schools in New Orleans, the majority of them charter schools, have failed to either accept disabled kids Okay, or upon accepting them, have failed to give them federally mandated services. And this is clearly a violation of federal civil rights law around the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act, right? And so, it, you know, you just consider that one uh, point of fact, right? And this so is a dynamic, we should say, that is not unique. I mean, much of this story is not unique to New Orleans. Uh, the, uh, much of this dynamic, we see it play out across the country. Um, uh, certainly a lot over the past 10 years, frankly. But yeah. this dynamic where the charter schools, on top of sort of self-selecting uh, from a pool of, uh, of, of students whose parents are engaged and have the, uh, what they call the social capital to, um, uh, to, to show up, to be able to um, uh, get their kids, even if it's in a lottery or whatnot, uh, but one of the other things that the charter schools around the country do is they do not take the full complement of students that are required to be taken by public schools. So, again, the the uh, the comparison is apples uh, is oranges to apples. I mean, well, absolutely. So, 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 so just like you said, you know, one class of kids is excluding disabled kids. Why would they do that? Well, they do that because they're not really there to educate all children. The school is now a business. It's a marketplace. These kids are expensive to serve. You need all kinds of, of specialists, right? Um, and, and they can drag down your scores and your, and your market reputation. And so you exclude them. Now, now the other dynamic that, that's at play in New Orleans and elsewhere is taking kids, and then if they don't perform to the standard uh, that the charter school wants, rather than engaging in the mission that public school should do, which is to serve every child to the best of its ability, they suspend and expel the kids. So there are charter schools in the city of New Orleans that have suspension rates as high as 70%. Wow. 
Um, and, and in fact, in one charter school network, uh, a community group has just filed a civil rights lawsuit. I'm uh, sorry, pardon me, not a lawsuit, a civil rights complaint, local, state, and federal, against the charter school network because of these, what they call harsh disciplinary culture in the school where kids are you know, constantly suspended. Uh, if, if kids refuse to, these are some of the uh, allegations in the civil rights complaint, if kids refuse to serve lunchtime detention, they're denied food. Uh, kids are being kept until after dark uh, for suspension. Kids are being suspended and kicked off of buses without parental notification. I mean, the list goes on and on, but it's a very punitive culture. And, and the attempt there is that, again, if kids are not, uh, you know, performing as the charter school network would like, they simply repeatedly suspend them and then ultimately expel them. Right. You know, and, and it's a travesty because, as we all know, getting back to that narrative, right, of charter school reform, these reformers have positioned themselves as, and I think this is terribly problematic and contradictory, as the new civil rights movements, right? Um, and that, that they're there specifically to fulfill the unfulfilled mission of Brown and to serve black and brown children um, in a way that they have not been served. And yet all we see is exclusionary practice after exclusionary practice. Uh, how are they serving these kids uh, by kicking them out? Well, I mean, it is uh, it is a, 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 a sort of a pure neoliberal uh, agenda here, where um, we're really just going to do this uh, for those who are going to get the numbers that are going to continue uh, to get the dollars flowing. So, I mean, give me and, and dollars are flowing, rest assured. Well, give me a, give me a sense of like what is what. What does the New Orleans um, school system look like now? How much of it has been privatized? Uh, how much of it is uh, remains sort of uh, traditional public schools? What is the awareness uh, within New Orleans of 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 the efficacy of this privatization? Yeah, yeah. Uh, so, so New Orleans is now the nation's first all charter school district as of this year. Wow. There is not another single neighborhood school left in the entire city. They've either been shut down or taken over by charter schools. And all of the charter schools, they're not neighborhood schools. They're open, presumably open to kids from across the city. Um, and so there are no more neighborhood schools. There are no more schools to which parents and students can feel that they have any substantive input all the schools are, across the city are privately operated uh, by charter operators, and they they are run by unelected boards. Publicly and funded. Boards we should say this. And students or teachers on them. Publicly funded, although the I would imagine uh, many of these charters augment their funding by from uh, who knows who. Uh, Road gates. All of your sort of market inspired national philanthropies have. Have, have put monies in. And so just as one example, right, we, to get back to new schools for New Orleans, we we're talking about them early on. You know, they've incubated a lot of the schools. So just one example, uh, you had a charter school operator in New Orleans called Future is Now Schools, hmm. who took over um, an historic high school, John McDonough, in New Orleans. So they took over the school. And this is the short version of a very horrible story. Uh, but they took over the school, and the head of the school of the charter operation was making $250,000 salary. And he had a host of other subsidiary sort of people like, you know, head of the freshman class, you know, director of community relations, a whole host of people in the administrative structure they created that were being paid $150,000. So that so many, so, so much of the grant monies that have come into New Orleans are basically going into six figure executive level salaries of these charter school operators. And in fact, not long after Katrina, a newspaper article came out in the Times Picayune, the local paper, that showed that administrative salaries have gone up substantially um, since pre, you know, as compared to pre Katrina levels. Um, and, and it's ironic, right? Because again, getting back to the narrative, these charter school advocates claim that they could do, that the market could do things more efficiently and effectively, right? So they could do more uh, 
more uh, with less, right. basically. You know, they, they could spend public monies uh, more responsibly. And yet that's not the case. What we see is that uh, the, a bloated administrative structure within these charter school operations where people are paying themselves. And so get back to John McDonough being taken over by Futures Now. I told you the head of that network was being paid $250,000 to operate the school. Well, that same school rated approximately a nine on a scale of 150. Okay. So so, I don't feel like I'm getting my money's worth. Right. Well, let me ask you this. Is the school budget on a per capita basis that in terms of the public funds, has that gone down? In other words, you know, one thing that has occurred to me and I've come to understand as a a parent of a uh, public school student in, in New York uh, and and uh, in, in sort of you know visiting a bunch of different schools is that in New York City uh, and and every educator I've talked to has said it's it's fairly easy to predict the quality of the school if you know the the median income in that district. But what what the dynamic that we have in New York City is is that the schools that excel always seem to have literally. Uh, uh, extra hundreds of thousands of dollars at their uh, disposal uh, because of the parent associations able to raise that money. Right. And in this context, we have the public funding these charter schools. And I guess I'm asking, are they funding them at the same levels that they did public schools? And then these charter schools also have the opportunity to go out and because they, uh, they're, they're companies, mm-hmm. um, they, uh, they can get investors. They can get mm-hmm. uh, investors uh, who are looking for payback in terms of cash, or they're looking for investors who are going to validate their uh, reform measures in some way. And so they're actually working with more resources, and we're still getting less out of it. Well, that, that's what's absolutely stunning. You're correct. Is that, and, and some of this is even difficult to calculate, right? Because um, they don't have to report um, all of the monies that are flowing into the school, but you're right. It, it makes it all the more astonishing that that do we know overall? Of- do we know overall the school budget, the public school budget in New Orleans, is is that down relative on a per capita basis? Because obviously there, 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 there very well could be less students we're dealing with because I don't know some 150 thousand people left the state uh, after uh, Katrina and not to return. Right, right. Well, well, interestingly, you know, um, that portion of the budget that would have been with Orleans Parish School Board, a bulk of that has shifted to the recovery school district, which presents a problem, right? Because then you've got monies based, partly based on local tax dollars, going to the operation and oversight of a state entity that is not elected by the people of Orleans Parish. So you've got that problematic dynamic. And in terms of the specific monies, you know, uh, RSD will tell you that they are... They are spending more um, on students now. Of course, they, the, the bottom line really hasn't changed. It's just that there are fewer students, right, right. under their care since Katrina, and so that money is, uh, is spread across fewer students. But in addition to that state money, okay, which has stayed relatively the same, you've got the infusion of millions of philanthropic dollars. Um, and, and yet despite that, despite that, the, schools are still, the charter schools are still on the whole Failing. And so, 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 what is the level of awareness amongst the community there? I mean, <laughs> is there is there any now? Are we starting to see any blowback? Yes, um, you know, and it's funny because there there is resistance on the ground in New Orleans, um, but but very often it doesn't get national media attention. So it, it gives the appearance that. The, that the, the African-American community in New Orleans, on the whole, is satisfied with the charterization of the city schools. And that, that simply is not the case. Um, so uh, there have been multiple, and I talk about some of this in the book, I have some case studies, where I document resistance in specific uh, communities in New Orleans around the takeover and charterization of, of the neighborhood school. So uh, a perfect example is like uh, is, is Douglas High School in the Upper Ninth Ward. So this was a long-standing high school, again struggling under state disinvestment, but still there were a lot of indigenous programs that veteran teachers were running in that school, and they really wanted and hoped that the school post 2005 could be a site of reinvestment, right? And really investing in the programs in that school that had been developed by the community. Instead. 
uh, state officials came in uh, and basically uh, deceived the community, telling them that have input into the future of the school. But before the draft master plan was actually put out for what would happen to school facilities across the city, the state superintendent put out a letter basically saying Douglas High School would be closed. But this was protested. I mean, there was a whole meeting called by, by the Douglas Community Coalition to talk to uh, state officials and to say this is not what we want for our school. We want to continue to control our school. We want monies and resources for our school. Um, and there was this, this, this movement that sort of arose, and yet the school was shut down and handed over to the very disciplinary National Charter School Operator Knowledge is Power Program, KIPP. Mm. So that was the end of that, right? Um, and, and we've seen this happen again and again. Many of the schools that have been taken over by charter school operators, there have been protests by alumni associations because many of these high schools have long legacies within the African-American community. And so a lot of community elders have come out to protest the transformation and, and, and evisceration of the school's legacy. In one case, an alum group came out and actually blockaded the school um, uh, for at least a week wow. uh, and, and made it impossible for the newly assigned principal to actually enter the school and run it. Uh, there have been student protests and walkouts as well. Um, students uh, who are fed up with their school being either taken over or handed from one charter school operator to the next, or an even more horrible scenario is kids who have made their way to their senior year only discover their high school is going to be closed you know, before they can graduate. Um, and so there have been a lot of student protests that have emerged as well, well. basically saying that it, in one case uh, the kids put out sort of a, a manifesto, uh, and I'm, this is not an exact quote, I'm sort of paraphrasing, but basically saying, you know, millions of dollars have come into the city of New Orleans, but none of it has helped the city's children. We want to learn. We don't want to line the pockets of other people. Kristen Burris, uh, associate professor at Georgia State University. The book is Charter Schools, Race, and Urban Space, Where the Market Meets Grassroots Resistance. Uh, Sam, if you could link to that, that would be we're great. We're definitely going to link the, at yeah. uh, majority.fm. We will link uh, to the Amazon page. The book is now in uh, in uh, paperback, so it's a, it's... Um, it's uh, not as expensive as it was originally released, and it's also um, uh, very reasonable as a Kindle uh, book as well. And uh, we will also link uh, to the debate that you had uh, back in 2012 yeah. with the CEO of New Schools. And this is important stuff, folks, because this is uh, really the the uh, the specific opportunity that was there for these corporate reformers in New Orleans is not there necessarily in in every city across the country, but the dynamic very, very similar. Yeah, and, and they are, New Orleans is being touted as national model. I get, I am consistently, and so are activists in New Orleans, contacted by groups across the country from Detroit, Nashville, Indianapolis, Cleveland, the list goes on. You know, Detroit, um, basically reaching out and saying, you know, what can you provide with us in terms of data that this is not a success because it's being used as a model in my community. Just recently, um, Governor Deal in Georgia announced that he wanted the state legislature here in Georgia to investigate Louisiana's recovery school district as a model. Mm. Uh, Tennessee's achievement school district is modeled after the RSD. The emergency manager in Detroit is modeled after the RSD. So, you know, uh, the, the conservative Fordham Institute, Thomas B. Fordham Institute, put out a report saying the RSD is a model for uh, Ohio. And so in cities across this country... It, you know, New Orleans is being touted as a model to be replicated. And I think community members, parents, teachers need to be very weary that, that this is not, in fact, a model unless what you want to replicate is complete dispossession of a community. Kristen Burris, thank you so much for your time today. Genuinely thank you so much, it. Sam. Bye-bye.